We've been uh, hearing these days about um, hearing God's word and God speak to you and God's word uh, coming personally to us. This uh, last year, I was in a church speaking when um, a group of people came to me after I finished speaking and they said, we have a word, of, word from the Lord for you. And um, this is the word that we want to share with you. And I thought it would be great for me to um, read for you this verse that was given to me. This is the prophet Jeremiah speaking in chapter 22. And um, is speaking to the son of Josiah. And he's talking to the son about the father. The father who is also a ruler, doesn't know what is justice, does not know what is righteousness. And these are Jeremiah's words. O to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and does not give him his pay for his work. Jeremiah to the son of Josiah, did not your father also eat and drink, but also do justice and righteousness? And all was well with him. He judged and defended the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him. And this was the verse that was given to me, this section of verse 16. Was, was not this what it means to know me, says the Lord. And I thought, wow, it was a lady who came and gave me this verse. And I said, one of my great quests in life, and I've tried to describe my walk with God as a quest for getting to know Him. And that's been a passion. Whether it's through the reading of the Word of God, through prayer, through the company of God's people, one of the great passions of my life has been to know God better and more and uh, clearer. And then, what has been a life passion is now translated in verse 16 and God says, don't you know that to be involved in the cause of justice, the cause of righteousness, uh, the cause of the oppressed is about knowing me. Not just through prayer, not just to the word, not just to the fellowship with the saints, not just through evangelism, not just through acts of compassion, but also through engagement in justice and righteousness and defending the cause of the poor and the needy. And it is true that um, as I uh, uh, look over the last 10 to 15 years of my life, um, 
without me really understanding and realizing until the verse really hit me. And it was a word from the Lord. I didn't realize that there is a knowing of God that has taken place in my life, which would not have been possible uh, otherwise. So my encouragement to us as we uh, look at this theme, and what I'm going to do is quickly just give you a few headlines, and then we'll have some questions and some interaction. My encouragement to you is that if your passion is about knowing God and worshiping God and finding God and recognizing God in your life, of feeling God, feeling the power of God, my encouragement to you and to your family and to your children, to your colleagues and to your workforce is uh, engage in the, cause, in the cause of God's justice, cause of God's righteousness uh, for this world. So that's just a personal testimony. Here are the few headlines I want to uh, give you as we look at this subject. Headline number one is what I briefly referred to, I think, yesterday uh, up there in the front in the main hall. But uh, headline number one is that kingdom mission requires an engagement in these four areas or an involvement in these four years, uh, four areas and seeing the acts of God in these four areas. Proclamation. And I just need to make a comment on the whole issue of proclamation. Many of us believe in proclamation, but what we understand by proclamation is not necessarily the same because some of us have reduced proclamation to one or two or three items of truth. When, when I talk about proclamation, I'm talking about the truth of the kingdom of God, telling people the truth about the kingdom of God, just not one little item here or one little item there, but we are called to announce, to explain, to tell people the good news of the kingdom of God, just as Jesus came announcing the good news of the kingdom of God. So that's proclamation. We, we have to engage in that. And I describe this as a table with four legs. So one leg is proclamation about the good news of the kingdom. The second leg is, of course, works and compassion, uh, which uh, works of mercy and compassion, which God calls us to, which Jesus went about doing while he lived upon this earth. And we see that as a very fundamental part of what God wants us to engage in. The third part is what uh, Peter referred to in his uh, inaugural talk and what we sense as a movement God is leading us to is to see uh, God's uh, action, God's wonders, God's signs, God's imminent presence in our midst so that uh, we see this God who is almighty, who is answering prayer, who is healing the sick, who is raising the dead, who is casting out demons, who is uh, really doing impossible things and showing his glory for a time like this. Very important component of kingdom mission. Uh, when Jesus lived and when he went about, whether it was in the synagogue or on the streets, people saw his, his mighty works and realized this kingdom of God that he is talking about is different from all the other stuff that we have heard. And so that's a component that is very, very important. And then the fourth one is the engagement in justice and righteousness and raising our voice for the defenseless, for the needy, uh, for the slave, and um, and working with God to put things right on earth. As N.T. Wright describes it uh, in his new book, Simply Christian, God's great agenda here on earth is to put things right. And here is the prophet Jeremiah telling the son of Josiah, you have lost it. You're, you're, you're supposed to be 
you know, a ro from the royal house of David, you're supposed to be a ruler, and you don't know what it is to be, a, to be God's ruler. You don't know what it is to engage in what God wants you to do. And part of your job is to engage in justice, in righteousness, and in um, putting things right. All of these four stools, the uh, four legs in this stool of kingdom mission are very, very important. That's headline number one. Headline number two is, in the world that we live today, Gary Hogan, International Justice Mission, says that as he has traveled around the world, he believes that the modern church movement is seeing a major outpouring of the Holy Spirit in raising a new army of Christian people in all of the continents who are concerned about justice. I would corroborate what he has seen. Without doubt, around the world, in all sections of the population, but especially among the young people in our church, there is a mighty wave of the Spirit to take on various justice issues and causes and make them uh, and work at them and apply them as part of kingdom mission. I think it's very important to understand this headline for us as OM, for us as an evangelical group, because we don't want to be out of step with the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit has awakened His church worldwide, especially the church in the poorer sections of the world, the church in the so-called global south, with many issues of justice, maybe the Spirit is leading us into a kingdom movement that will bring a huge, great harvest for the kingdom. As much as the spirit movement that erupted all over the world simultaneously at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. This whole Pentecostal charismatic revival was not isolated and limited to New York. While Azusa Street was experiencing its awakening and revival, there was simultaneously stuff going on in Latin America, Simul simultaneously stuff going on in Africa in the church, simultaneously st uh, revival uh, and gifts of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues going on in India. One of the great stories I heard from the Panda, uh, Pandita Ramabai Mukti Mission people uh, and their home in Pune was how around the same time at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, the Holy Spirit came on Mukti Mission and many of these women who were raised as orphans, etc., were prophesying, speaking in tongues, experiencing the same Holy Spirit God's people were experiencing around the world and a new understanding of not just the Holy Spirit, but how the Holy Spirit works in the church came upon the church worldwide. Similarly, across the world, you just have to go and touch this hot button today or speak on this issue today in the church and you, you see immediately the kind of response you get from all sections of the people but especially among the young. So that's a very, very important headline. The next headline is, and I've asked this question over the last decade, why now God, why now are you moving the church in the area of justice? And there may be many reasons. But there is one huge problem with Christian mission around the world. And the great problem is the loss of credibility of the church, 
large sections of the church, and the loss of credibility of what is seen as Christianity. Let me explain. Right now, Europe, the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican is facing a huge crisis in that they have had religion, they have had their masses, but their leadership has engaged in the kind of sexual abuse of children which it is very hard to believe that whether we think of them as true Christians or false Christians is another issue. But somebody who goes by the name of Christ, somebody who goes by the name of minister of Jesus Christ, somebody who says that God has given me a vocation, has actually engaged in this. It's a, it's a crisis of huge credibility for, for the Christian church. And that's not the only crisis that we have faced, we are faced with. There are huge issues of credibility. Uh, one, one of the big issues of our time is earning, the church globally earning the right to be heard. Why should anybody believe our message? When they look at the history of the church, the history of Christianity, even in the last 200 years, why should anybody believe? I get emails almost on an everyday basis from enemies of Christianity just talking about what's going on with the Catholic Church because for the enemies, this is all Christianity. This is all the church. And I'm reminded of uh, this uh, statement of uh, Dorothy Sayer, this American writer, who said, you know, Christ did not just go through two, two humiliations. Christ actually went through and is going through the third humiliation. The first humiliation that Christ went through, of course, was Son of God became man incarnation. Second humiliation was Son of God became man, is crucified as a criminal on the cross. But as she says, the biggest, I mean the most challenging humiliation that the Lord has had to go through is the church for 2,000 years. The shame we bring, the testimony we have ruined, etc., etc. So there is the problem of credibility, the issue of the right to be heard. And now looking at church history, there's another issue. And this is not a you know, condemnation or criticism of anybody. Martin Luther, when the Reformation was taking place, talked about a church that is linked to power and glory and money and a church that is poor and linked to suffering and to prophecy and reformation. Unfortunately, for the past thousand years, Christendom has been linked with power and glory. First it was the Catholic Church. Then of course you have the rise of Western civilization with its power, with its money, with its structures. And the church is associated with that structure. And when the church is part of that structure, the church equally finds it very difficult to address which may be blind issues or unconscious issues of oppression that is unleashed 
and somehow the church is connected. So you've got that history working against us. The biggest, um, ex most exciting thing of the 21st century that church that is emerging around the world is Thankfully, the church in India, the church in China, the church in Africa, the church in Latin America is not the church of political power. It's not the church of monetary power. It's not the church of structural power. There are huge numbers, but it is the church of the poor. It is the church of the powerless. It's the church which does not run structures as of now. Maybe 50 years from now, in China and in India, and even in Latin America and Africa, if the church again becomes part of the power structure, we will have the same problem all over again. And when you're part of the church, of the power structure, part of the glory structure, it's very, very very easy to, to not look at what's really going on here, what are we unleashing on the world, what are we challenging, what are we not challenging. That's a headline we need to keep in mind. Credibility, our past history of a thousand years. People ask this question, why do you think it's now the Holy Spirit is, is um, pouring the spirit of resurgence in the history of justice, uh, in the involvement in justice and righteousness, et cetera, et cetera. I think the, the, the church that is the majority is the church of the poor, and the church of the poor and the church of the suffering is ideally suited to respond to this and raise questions of justice, huge and large, before a watching world. Now, next headline. It's not that during the last thousand years, the church has not done justice. It's not that for the last 2,000 years, we have not done justice. We have done. In fact, right now, for the first time, serious research is being made as to what really happened in the first few centuries and what really turned the world upside down. What was Jesus all about? Was Jesus involved in justice? Of course he was involved in a ministry of justice and righteousness along with all of the other three uh, ministries. We think of William Carey even in the modern missionary era. Man much beyond his time coming to India, not just interested in preaching the gospel, not just interested in translating uh, the Bible into many languages, but very concerned to abolish the practice of sati, the bright burning uh, practice, the most horrible kind of oppression un unleashed on women anywhere in the world. Living women to be burned because their husbands die. And then he worked on banning ch child marriage. So you got William Carey. We got the contemporary of William Carey, William Wilberforce. All friends working on the issue of slavery. Then we had Judson in Burma. Ta Judson was a missionary. Listen to this very carefully, because Burma still is fighting for its basic democratic rights. But Judson was, Judson was the first one to encourage the political rights of the Burmese people. So we have a great, grand legacy. It's not that the people of God have not responded. We have these great except, uh, examples. And this morning, Daniel, I didn't know Daniel was going to refer to Bonhoeffer and the remnant during the Holocaust that decided we are not going to succumb like the large sections of the church have succumbed. So we got a great history of positive involvement in justice and an attempt to bring, put all things right and to demonstrate the kingdom of God. At the same time, next headline, we have the, we have the bad side in church history. And I have to mention you know, four recent things. One is, of course, 
the church's response during the Holocaust. We must never forget that. The Catholic Church is on a huge spin uh, campaign to deny how the Pope of that time, you know, failed. Because they're trying to canonize that Pope who, who ruled during Hitler's time. And so this is a huge controversy now. What on earth is the Catholic Church trying to do? We need to admit that large sections of the church was silent. There was a remnant that raised their voice. So you have that problem. You have the problem of the civil rights movement in America. We should have been on the forefront. We were not. And here's another example. Soon after the Edinburgh missionary worldwide, like the Lausanne conference of that day, we had, they had a Berlin evangelization mission conference. There was one notable, uninvited absentee in the Berlin Evangelization and Mission Conference. Guess who? Guess who? One notable, great Christian justice worker, Martin Luther King, was not invited. So you have that side of church history. Today, of course, all the evangelicals, many sections of the church worldwide are claiming Martin Luther King as their own, and rightly so. Then you have the struggle of the apartheid system in South Africa. Mixed bag, again, in terms of the church's response. Fourthly, the Indian church and the caste system. Shameful legacy up till now. Yes, there's a remnant that has spoken, but by the majority, the Indian church has allowed and condoned and carried out the caste system within the church. So you have the positive, you have the negative as you try to deal with where we are coming from and how do we address the issues of justice today. Next. Um, Next headline is the challenge of our time. But before I go to the challenge of our time, I want to talk about Jesus. I used to always read Jesus' uh, section on the children very differently than I read today. Today I know that during Jesus' time, there were child slaves. I know that during Jesus' time, there was also pedophilia. And I know that Jesus was speaking in the context where children, the most vulnerable, were being exploited during his time and saying, please do not keep children from coming to me. In that context, Jesus was saying, if any one of you stumble any child, it is better for you to put a rock on your neck and to drown yourself rather than hurt a child. He was speaking to a social, spiritual context of his day. It was not in isolation of some nice Christian picture that we, are, we were shown, Jesus with some nice middle-class family children. No, no, no. He was talking to a horrendous situation even during his time. Then. Jesus' whole emphasis on reaching out to the prostitutes. Philip Yancey has done some brilliant chapters on this. The most outcast of all societies, of all groups of his day, and Jesus saying, no, I've come for them. And then the story of whether it's a Samaritan woman, the woman caught in adultery, and the naming of the women who followed him, and the naming of the women who saw him after he was first resurrected, after he was resurrected. Incredible stuff. It's all there. Then, Jesus taking on the hypocritical, oppressive, exploitative, religious structure of his day. 
The Gospels are full of it. How, how can we not, how can we miss it? How can we not observe it? It's right there in our face. So you got Jesus' example, which uh, compels us today, okay, if this is, this is the kingdom, along with the truth, along with love, along with signs and wonders, this is an element that God is calling us to. You, you ask the headline, uh, what, what is the situation around the world today? What do we deal with? Here are a few things. I think for us as OM, it will be good to look at the issue of uh, modern slavery worldwide. There are more slaves today than there were during Wilberforce's time. According to the UN, highly technically defined slavery, they say minimum 28 million. Half of which are in the Indian subcontinent, but half of which are around every continent everywhere in the world. That is a very technical definition of modern slavery. But the figure is far larger. How can the church anywhere be quiet on the issue of buying or selling of human beings, or buying or selling of women, or buying and selling of children, and their exploitation? Our government in India has finally admitted there are over 100 million Indians directly and indirectly impacted by human trafficking. That is a real figure for India. Now, what is the real figure for the whole world? What is the figure for Central Europe? What is the figure for China? What is the figure for the Philippines? What is the figure for Africa? What is the figure for Latin America? If it is true that the human trafficking business worldwide now is equivalent to the drug business, who is profiting from that money? Is there any possibility that indirectly I am profiting from that money? From that labor, from that exploitation. I'm not directly involved in it, but am I profiting? Is my country profiting? Recently we had the Olympics in Vancouver, right? And um, one of our campaigners, Canadian MPs there, sent this news report out. It's very interesting, she said, well, while the media and everybody is focused on the games, which is wonderful, there are 50,000, at least 50,000 women, a lot of them traffic on the streets of Vancouver serving everybody who has come. It's going to happen in South Africa when the world soccer game takes place. We have evangelism to the sportsmen, we have evangelism to the athletes, we have evangelism to the media. What about evangelism to the hundreds of thousands of girls and women who will be trafficked when the world soccer game is going on? It's all around, but it's not in our face. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? So that's, for me, a huge issue. The second big problem and issue of our time that we have to address, and Kamal now is going great guns, and today again Daniel referred to this as the right to believe and worship, the most fundamental of all rights. That is under assault. 
you know that not just the Muslim nations of the world came together to change the UN Declaration on Freedom of Conscience, but the Hindus are into it, the Buddhists are into it, all right-wing fundamental religions would like to take, including some sections of the Christian Church, like the Greek Orthodox, they would like to take away the fundamental right of all human beings to believe the God they want to believe, to practice the religion they want to practice, and to go to the church they want to go. Will we raise our voice? So that's another huge issue that uh, we are dealing with. The third one is the issue of systemic poverty. And the, that little phrase is used Deliberately. Systemic poverty. It's not poverty because people are lazy. It's not poverty because people are not working. It's not poverty because people are not gifted. It's not poverty because people do not, uh, have, don't want to go to school. It is poverty because the system enforces it. Exploitative market policies, exploitative governments ensure that a certain class of the poor continue to stay in that situation. It's all over. Today, in the last 24 hours, the Maoists in India tried to blow up the Rajdani train. Fortunately, nobody died, but they did blow up the train. Who are the Maoists? What are, they, what are they up to? Why does Prime Minister Manmohan Singh say they are the biggest security threat to India more than the Muslims? Terrorists. Why? These are millions of Dalits and tribals whose land has been taken away. So they have no homes. Their forests have been taken away by multinationals and the state. Their women have been taken away and sold into the sex trade. Their culture has been destroyed, and they're refugees in their own country. Where will they get justice? Systemic poverty, whether it's in India, whether it's in uh, Africa, whether it's in Latin America, will not go away quietly. When those people's, those people's problems are not dealt with, and we don't look at the structural side of things, they will erupt in violence. Those are the three headlines. I close with this one, two powerful illustrations, and then we'll take a couple of, uh, no, we'll take questions. One is uh, Mother Teresa. She's one of my heroines of the faith. Um, none of us are fit to go and even, and if she was alive, to wash her sandals. What an enormous, compassionate ministry she did and millions who think of Christ better now in India and around the world because of her. So we praise God for her life and her testimony, etc. But recently I was reading in an Indian magazine that just outside Mother Teresa's home where she began her ministry and then died after 60 years of work in those same temple premises in the same places more people are left dying and nobody cares. So, 60 years later, thousands of people are still being treated as less than animals and left outside to die and nobody cares. What is that? 60 years of life, there's no answer yet. That's one. Recently, the IJM people in India and in Washington came to us and said, we are learning something very fast in the last 10 years. We are involved in justice mission. And in Chennai, they said in the last seven years, we rescued 1,500, 1,500 bonded laborers. We went and rescued. And today, 1,500 new bonded laborers are there. We need to fight justice, but we now need to figure out how to change the system. Uh, how do we change the system? 
truth, law, loving, working, asking God to once again do in our world what he has done many times in the history of the human race, in the Old Testament, and since the church was born. There have been glorious pe uh, periods when laws were changed, where single-handedly men like Wilberforce turned around the whole parliament after 25 years. So that's where this dialogue goes. God has called us to join us, join him in bringing people to him and a relationship with him. Absolutely true. He's also called us to work with him to put all things right here and bring justice and to show justice. So those are the main headlines for this lunch.